You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lee Carpenter. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Business Essentials for Authors is your Business 101 guide for the publishing industry. Whether you've never published at all or are looking to take your professional career up a notch in an easy-to-read and conversational way, the book covers the five pillars of business. We look at all of this and more from a long-term strategic view. How to get the plan done and the mindset to make it all work. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to 4, that's the number 4, thewords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the the seat-in-the-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off 
a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Lee Carpenter on the show. She has a fantastic book called Red, White, and Blue. Uh, it is out now in paperback. It's been out uh, in hardcover uh, since last year, but it's now available in paperback, Kindle edition, audiobook, and any way that you read books. Uh, welcome to the show, Lee. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, before we get into the book and, and all of that good stuff, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I um, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, and it was about a 25, depending on traffic, minute drive in the morning from my house to where I went to school. And my father drove us to school every morning, and he would tell us stories on the ride to school, usually Greek myths, although once we ran through all the myths, um, we moved on to other things. But he always had a story that would essentially run for 20 minutes, the length of time it took to drive to school. And um, many years later, I thought back, and I wondered if maybe he just did that as a way to avoid talking to three young, unruly you know, children, but that memory is still so powerful for me. And it really, um, you know, every day of my life started with a story. Um, I also later learned that he would, he would reread the myth or whatever story he was going to tell us, he would reread it the night before, but he took such care in trying to, you know, make the stories riveting and we would sit in traffic and, but we'd be, you know, in the labyrinth with the Minotaur or wherever we were that day. And I think I, I probably wasn't conscious of it at the time, but I knew I loved stories. Um, and then it took me a long time before I got a, the confidence to really write a book. But uh, the art of storytelling was, was one that was impressed upon me from a really, really young age. Do you think your dad was a frustrated short story writer? <laughs> I think, he, <laughs> you know, he, he apparently, he was a lawyer, but he... um. He had an idea, as most people do. He had an idea for a novel, and um, he never talked to me about it. But after he died, my mother found in his drawer the first page. So he basically written one page of the book um, and and a sort of concept page. And uh, I think that he felt that writing was the highest art form. He he. He loved reading, uh, as does my mother, but I think he felt it was something that he hadn't earned the right to do. And I think I myself felt that way for a long time, that some God comes down and anoints people who, who are allowed to tell stories. Um, and I certainly didn't feel I had earned that privilege um, and that I should be doing uh, you know, more, more serious kinds of work. And then, of course, as you know, you just do it. You just one day you just do it and then and then you are a writer. Um, so you well, anoint yourself. I guess. That's right. That's right. Uh, self anointed and self appointed. Um, I guess. Um, did Did you ever try your hand at at writing fiction, like in in school or um, kind of when did when did the uh, you know, a lot of times people will have these these ideas uh, until it kind of gets squashed out of you. Uh, and then, you, you know, it takes a while to come back to that. Uh, did you have an experience like that? Were you writing when you were younger uh, and then life got in the way? Or was this something that, that, like you said, you kind of had to earn up the courage to begin? I uh, loved the theater. And um, if I aspired to be a writer, the the earliest aspiration was probably to be a playwright. And to that end, I wrote... Um, you know, I did some playwriting, which probably was horrible. <laughs> did some, you know, stage adaptations of book books that I liked, you know, in college. But um, once I got out in the real world, I I wasn't doing much much creative writing, um, and I had never taken a creative writing class. And it was really, um, 
a, a literary agent who sort of dared me uh, to, to try and write fiction. I had been writing some speeches for um, Bo Biden, who was the attorney general for the state of Delaware, and he, Bo, had been a JAG in Iraq, and we spent a lot of time talking about the military and, um, you know, our generation in the military, and so, and my father had been in the military, and after he died, I started reading everything I could on the subject of the military, uh, which, as you know, is a genre largely defined by books written by men, for men, and about men, and, um, you know, and this agent kept sort of needling me, like, maybe you have a story to tell. Um, and he said, if you write 10,000 words and I think they're any good, I'll, you know, I'll represent you. And one of the books that I read during that time um, was Lone Survivor. And um, do, you, do you know that book? Um, yeah. And um, ironically, because I later went on to work with Peter Berg, who made the film adaptation of that book, but I didn't know him at the time. I just, I read the book and uh, what was so moving to me in that book was Marcus Luttrell's description, at least my memory of it, of what went on in his house in Texas while he was missing um, in Afghanistan. And what went on in that house was essentially that it filled up with people. The house became a sort of 24-hour um, vigil um, of friends and family, you know, waiting to hear news of him. And I remember asking myself at the time, you know, if I, if I was the mother of someone who I'm missing and I was in that house, what would I want to do? And I thought I'd, I'd want to get out of the house. So I wrote was it, what was essentially a short story about a mother whose son has gone missing in Afghanistan and she goes for a run. And as she's, as she's running through her neighboring yards, she's asking herself, you know, how did I, how did I get here? And she kind of tells herself the story of her child from when he was born and grew up and what he was like. And, when he told her he was going into the military and uh, and she falls and skins her knee. And you know, when she gets back to her house, she sees there's a new car in her driveway and there are two uh, you know, military officers in the car. And that's, that's kind of where the short story ended. And that ended up being the, that ended up being sort of the first chapter of my first book, 11 days. The uh, I read 11 days a, a couple of years ago and I was, struck by uh, like you said most military stories are told by men for men uh and and there's a a very particular tone um to those books and many of them are wonderful and and fabulous and and have stories that that absolutely need yeah. to be told um but there's always another side and um you know what what doesn't get highlighted enough are the people at home and those relationships and the uh, fallout, if you will, of, of war at home. And uh, th that's what really struck me about the book is how poignant it was and what an untold story um, that, that... Thank you. Yeah, and, and that... that and, you know, and, that and by the feels... way, I don't, I don't think the genre is, you know, by saying it's male, I don't think it's you know, sexist. I just think there's sort of a supply-demand... Absolutely. ...with those kinds of stories that men tend to want them more um, or have tended to want them more in the past. Right. Um, and these wars have just been so unending. Right. And um, I wanted to see if I could tell tell a, tell a different kind of story. So. Well, and it, it, uh, it started to fill some of the vacuum that was there. And I, I think there, there are lots more stories like that that need to be told. Um, but yeah. uh, what was the, what was the reception uh, for, for that book? Did when, it when people so started reading great. it? Yeah. You know, I, um, so I wrote that short story in, you know, the spring of 2011. Knopf bought the book based on, um, the first few chapters in August. And I went in to, um, to meet with my editor there in September. And she said, um, listen, to take all the time you need. You know, you, you've got to do some research and there's no deadline and just bring in the book when it's ready. And I said, well, um, I just found out I'm pregnant. So you'll have the book in eight months. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I was pretty, um, I wrote it, you know, I wrote it, I wrote it, quickly and I look back on it now and I see that in some of um in some of the book but it was the reception was really lovely um 
critically and then most importantly from the community of um, people who had really opened their doors to me, the Navy SEAL team community and, uh, and, the, and the people that I met in that journey. I needed to sort of cite the book in a specific community and because I knew some folks in the SEAL teams, I thought they could, you know, correct me if I made any errors. And I tried to just tell this story of sort of what was this thing called special operations and how did it come out of World War II and how 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 have we ended up where we are today? Um, but you know, that's not a novel; that's a history lesson. So I tried to I tried to weave it, interweave it with a story of a mother who just my mother had my brother when she was 19 years old. So I was thinking, you know. You could be in, you could be 40 and have a son, you know, deploying in the military, um, or certainly in your early 40s. And uh, I had this idea of a single mother in her early 40s who, um, you know, was living in the part of the world that I grew up in around Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, and was so unimaginably far away from her son's daily life and what he was doing and how she was trying to stay connected to that. How do you uh, go about doing uh, research for a book like that? I, I know that you said you had some friends that were SEALs, uh, but that is uh, notoriously uh, a close fraternity, uh, you know, with a lot of things held close to the uh, to the chest. Did, did you get to talk to family members? Um, of, I did. Uh, yeah. You know, I found that, you know, if you just have one or two friends, they will um, they will help you open doors. I started doing my research um, on that community uh, in particular in April 2011. And in May 2011, of course, there was the raid to kill Osama bin Laden and suddenly everyone knew what a Navy SEAL was and every journalist wanted to talk to Navy SEALs. And um, But I think I had going for me um, that I was completely unknown. Um, probably that I was female, definitely that I was writing fiction, which is not very threatening. Um, and, you know, within a few months that I was pregnant. So I would show up to talk to folks and I certainly didn't look like a hard hitting investigative journalist who wanted to expose their secrets. And, um, and also I, you know, if people were willing to talk to me, what I wanted to talk about was, you know, questions I wanted to ask were questions like, what is your relationship with your mother? And how many times a day do you Skype your girlfriend from the base? And, um, you know, what tools do you do to self-medicate given the circumstances of your work? And I found invariably that um, once someone's spoken to you about their mother, their girlfriend, and their addiction problems, if they have them, um, you know, I would say thank you. And I would get up to leave and they would say, wait, don't you want to hear about, you know, the bin moderator, <laughs> don't you want to hear about this other thing? And so I had these sort I had this sort of like side set of stories that I always got in the last ten minutes of my of my interactions that were the um you know, that were the sort of tactical stories um or um bits of history and those were fascinating too and I tried to weave some of those into the book, but that was not what I was going for. I was going for as I did with Red White Blue, I, I was really going for understanding the character and emotional temperament of people who work in very extreme uh, situations. Right. In publishing that book, what did that open up for you, uh, not only in terms of your publishing career, uh, but in, in terms of, of your creative outlook. Um, you talked about, you know, that, that feeling that a lot of people have that you need to be anointed by the writing gods. Um, well, you know, getting that first project out tends to, to change the way you feel about that. Um, uh, one, what kind of professional doors did that open? And, and two, how did it affect you creatively? It opened doors in terms of, you know, Knopf has just been so supportive of me. My editor there, Shelley Wanger, I, the luckiest thing that ever happened to me was the day I met Shelley Wanger. She just believed in me and my work so consistently um at another time in my career i met this i worked with a copy editor who worked at fsg but she also was susan sontag's personal copy editor and she told me a story once that eventually um 
Susan Sontag became so sort of dependent on her that even when she wrote a postcard, she would show it to this woman whose name was Carla to, to copy edit it. Um, and I sort of feel like even when I write a postcard, I, I almost want to send it to Shelly <laughs> Wanger because she's, you know, she, she knows my voice so well. Um, I think it, I think the most important door it opened was less professional and more psychological in terms of saying, okay, now I'm going to do this. I'm not, I'm not going to turn away again. I'm going to try and do this thing and I'm not going to use every excuse in my, you know, psychological toolbox to go away from trying to be a creative um, person. And, um, because that, you know, those tools were pretty well honed after lots of years of use. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to lean into this and, uh, and, uh, and try and write another book. So, so that was helpful. And now I forget the second part of your question. Well, I, I was just asking, um, the, the, you know, doors open, create, uh, um, professionally, yeah. but what did it do for you creatively? At, at creatively? And, and I think you, you kind of answered that, that it was really more of a creative opening anyway. Yeah. And I'll just say one more thing, which yeah. is, um, I've compared, um, you know, looking into the world of military and veterans and later intelligence was kind of like, you know, well, for me, like walking into a homeless shelter and saying like, I, this, this is where I need to be, you know, that I can do something here. I can do something differently. I can help. There's so much to be done here. So many stories to be told. Um, and I sort of thought I found my subject matter in a way. And so for a period of time, I really only wanted to write into that subject matter. And that, that broadened out a little bit with Red, White, Blue. Um, and now I, you know, six years later, I think maybe I'm ready to m- move on to a, to a different topic. But I really wanted to live in that world and try and understand it um, in, in, in one way through, through 11 days. And I, you know, I wrote some short fiction and... Um, nonfiction. And, uh, so that was, that was a creative journey for me because it was not a subject matter that might've been an obvious match for me, uh, you know, 10 years prior. You, uh, you also wrote the screenplay for mile 22, didn't you? I did. That, uh, that's an interesting bridge between, um, <laughs> 11 days and, and the new novel, red, white, blue. Um, what was that experience like and how did you get tapped for that? Um, Mall 22 happened after Red, White, Blue was already into the publisher. Um, uh, Peter Berg, who directed Mall 22, had come to an event I did for 11 days. And he had also been doing a lot of research um, in the SEAL team community. I mean, he had embedded with a SEAL team, I think, in Afghanistan and uh, had really gone deep into trying to understand that community in the lead up to writing uh, Lone Survivor, that he adapted the Marcus Luttrell book, and I, I thought that was a beautiful film. And I think he was surprised to find someone else um, who had such a similar journey. I mean, like, we'd been in the same rooms and on the same basis, we knew some of the same folks. Uh, and I think he sort of wanted to know, like, how did you you get in there um, in, a, in a very nice way? And then he, he read 11 Days and... Um, you know, sent me a beautiful note about it and said, you know, let's work together one day. And then I called him and he said, you know, I have this, uh, I have a script. I'd like you to look at it. And uh, it's a small action movie um, that he said, I really want to work with this actor called Iko Uwe, who had been in a movie called The Raid, um, which if you, if you haven't seen, I recommend it. But The Raid <clears throat> is... Um, it's an Asian action movie with a very simple structure and premise. A group of guys go in on the ground floor of a building. They fight they, their way up 10 floors. They fight their way back down 10 floors and they leave the building. And it sounds ridiculously simple, <laughs> right. but the movie is incredibly compelling. It's like a, it's like a Chekhov short story. It's a, it's a beautiful film. Anyway, I'm very kinetic and, Pete was interested in doing something like that, which I had no idea how to do. So I read the script he gave me and I said, you know, I don't know if I know how to do this. I said, but um, the story I'd like to tell is the story of a mother whose child is killed on 9-11. 
who 10 years later is invited into the Situation Room to watch the killing of Osama bin Laden. Not exactly that story, but structurally that story. And so we kind of took, I, with that structural nut, we overlaid that onto what had to be, you know, a small group of people fighting their way in one direction and then fighting their way in another direction. And with those two things um, together, you know, he came to me and said, I'd like you to write this and you know how to write a screenplay. And I said, you know, I'll figure it out. And um, he said, well, this is an action movie. So um, it needs to have three, at least three big set piece action scenes to just start writing. And when you get to the point in the story where you think we can do the action scene, just write, there will be action here. And then we'll go back and I'll teach you how to do that. And for me, it was really a master class in um, learning how to write a screenplay, learning how to write action in particular, um, learning how to write for specific actors. Um, once those actors came on and uh, it was, it was great, but I think we came together because we, he admired, you know, we admired um, what we both had done with what we'd learned about the SEAL team community. That was the origin of the bond. He continues to be you know, a really important mentor to me. That's fantastic. Um, as uh, as a novelist and a screenwriter, those two forms are, uh, are very similar, yet in the execution they're very different um, in, in that the screenplay uh, is mostly dialogue and, uh, you know, some, some set direction. Uh, but as a novelist, you have to flesh out those things and, and paint a word picture of, of the action. Um, do you feel like that working... Uh, on on the screen uh, on the screenplay has given you tools as a novelist that will benefit you in the future. Yeah, um, you know, film is really a direct the director's medium. So so Pete is the visionary, and I am the um, you know I'm help I'm helping out, but I'm playing a role, and there are lots of other people playing their roles, and so it's humbling in that way, but. There's a real economy and fairness that comes into play with screenwriting. And he was really adamant about, I think my, my writing um, is anyway kind of spare, um, or at least I've, I've been told that. But working with him, he was constantly um, pushing me to be more succinct, more concise, use less words, say more with less. Um, you know, I think he and I are happiest where, you know, you have a blank page with six words on it and that, and, you know, one will never get there because that does not make for an interesting story, but repeatedly pushing each other in that direction. So I would write a, you know, 800 word monologue, the character, um, Jimmy, uh, which I created, um, from Mark Wahlberg and then which he inhabited. The idea was that this guy never stopped talking. So in the middle of a movie with lots of things going on um, and lots of things exploding and people speaking less, this is a guy who cannot stop talking. And so I got to sort of flex the muscle of like writing very long speeches for him. And then we would try and lean them out or try and um, like the editorial process on that was was interesting for me. And it, it, it makes me think about being more disciplined as a prose writer too. When, and having a scene like that where, uh, everyone else is hunkering down and this character just goes on and on and on really adds to the frenetic nature uh of that and uh I, I think that's would be a great exercise in 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 uh showing not telling by by kind of escalating the situation by having this character go into their deeper self and and start their neuroses uh, coming out uh, I think that would be a, a great thing to practice with uh that that yeah, we I can learn from them. screenwriting after um after I got that job, I thought, oh no, I, now I better figure out what to do here. <laughs> um, and so I googled, you know, screenplay writing, and up came a class um, with Aaron, an, an online class with Aaron Sorkin, the master class. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's started, fantastic. Which I, which I which I bought and started listening to. Um, and at one point in that, and this was my biggest takeaway from it, Sorkin says one of the students, he says, you know, you can write something that's completely improbable and outrageous as long as you call attention to it. 
So for example, he, this is not the example he gives, but what's coming to mind is like, you know, the elephant walks onto the airplane, you know? And so the elephant walks onto the airplane, but someone has to say, oh my God, there's an elephant on the airplane. How did that happen? <laughs> and as long as someone points out how ridiculous it is, you can kind of take the audience with you. And so when I had this idea that this character, Jimmy Silva, like won't shut up and he will give these, you know, 10 minute long disquisitions on Lincoln's first inaugural, like in order to save it from being pretentious, there has to always be another character who says, Jimmy, Jimmy, you know, or, or who points out how ridiculous he's being. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if it works, but that was the, that was the little, uh, lesson that I took from, took from Sorkin. And it's, it's true. And it happens in literature too. You can take, you can take a reader or, or an audience member anywhere with you if you, if you earn their trust. And Pete Berg also says, um, because it's a at the end of the movie, there's a twist, and um, he used to say, if you're going to bring the audience to the one-yard line and kick them in the teeth, you have to know that um, many of them will love you for it, and some of them will hate you. Um, so we, with that movie, we, brought, we tried to bring you to the one-yard line and then kick you in the teeth. So. <laughs> well, it worked. It worked. Thanks. Thanks. Um, the new book, Red, White, Blue, uh, once again, you have brought us a story um, that uh, kind of defies genre um, uh, specifications in, in that this is, this is very much um, uh, a spy thriller, a, um, uh, you know, in that kind of big summer um, thriller vein, yet you bring us a very close um, – uh, personal story, and it's it, it's almost unlike anything that I've ever really read. In that you merge those uh, those kind of big set pieces with this really close Thank and um, very intimate. It, maybe intimate's the word I'm looking for. Um, tell us about Anna, uh, your your main character. How did she come to you, and what was the initial idea to do a book like this? After 11 Days came out, I had a few conversations with folks who were affiliated with or had been affiliated with CIA. And uh, one case officer in particular offered to sit with me and share some of his stories. And um, I can't, I honestly can't remember if he was the person or if it was another friend of mine who said to me, you know, Lee, um, asking someone, betray their country is really not that different from asking someone to marry you. Um, and I sort of, you know, pricked up at my ears at that. And he went on to say, because in both cases, um, there's a lot of risk involved. And in both cases, you don't ask the question unless you're pretty sure you know the answer. And I had to understand what he meant, but it made me curious. Um, and it made me think that I could take, just as I say, 11 days was about special operations and motherhood, um, that I could take marriage, which is an organization or an institution in which there's a lot of um, complexity and uh, where trust is essential, um, that I could take that institution, um, which I had once been a part of, um, and look at CIA uh, and marriage as sort of echoes of one another. So I wanted to tell the story of a marriage that hits a kind of crisis, and I wanted to tell the story of the culture and history of CIA and see if I could merge those two things. And I was almost writing two separate books at once. Um, and then I, I figured out a way to merge them, and I hope it works in the book. Um, Anna is of course, in, in some ways, me, as all my characters are, because she has um, lost her father. I lost my father. And the um, place where she's sort of emotionally living is, is really mourning. So how she, um, you know, she's got this very dynamic husband, and he launches a political campaign, and he's charismatic, and there's lots of drama in her life. And you know, the FBI investigates her for her father's possible collusion with the Chinese. And like, there's lots of, I, th I hope there's enough plot in the book, but 
but the the heart of the book, I think, is really just the young woman who's trying to understand what it meant to have such a close relationship with her father as I had with my father and what it means to try and live without him. Um, you know, after my own father died, someone said to me, you know, Lee, no one's ever going to love you like he did. And I remember at the time thinking that was a horrible thing to say, but later understanding it as a compliment. And the relationship between Anna and her father um, is central, as is the relationship between Anna and her husband. And, um, you know, she's, she's very strong in her own quiet way. Um, and then at the end of the book really becomes activated to at the end of the book. She understands how her father is tied into everything else. At the end of the book, she, she gets to the heart of her, who her father was. Right. Um, uh, a couple of things you said that, that I want to, um, touch on uh, you said that Anna is a lot like you in a lot of ways and that uh, you know in so many cases the characters that we write uh, embody pieces of ourselves um, one thing that I've noticed is that uh, in, in readers always assume that, that you are the main character um, and the truth is a lot of times uh, there are pieces of us in all of the characters um, do you find yourself writing pieces of of yourself in other characters that people may not uh, immediately think? I do. I mean, the character of her husband, for example, um, is a guy who dropped out of Brown to start a record company, which he sells for a lot of money. And then he launches his political campaign. Like none of that, all of that is very foreign to my own experience, but I tried to give him a sense of humor, which is probably my sense of humor. And um, in their in their love scenes, um, you know, I tried to tried to imbue those love scenes with dynamics of moments I've had in my own life. It's all you can really do as a writer. I mean, I went as far away from that sort of golden rule of writing what you know as you could do if you look at my work on the surface. Oh, she wrote about special operations. Oh, she wrote about CIA. Like, what does Lee Carpenter have to do with any of that? But on the other hand, I really wrote the story of a mother. I am, a, I myself am, um, am a mother of two two sons, and um, and then with this book, I wrote the story of a girl trying to deal with the loss of her father, with massive other complexities coming at her all the time. But really, her her interior story is a story of trying to get o- get over that loss. And I myself had gone through that journey. Well, I think. Um... You know the 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 trappings and the um, tropes of of genre tend to be kind of window dressing on on the real story that we're telling, and, and we're all telling stories about uh, the human condition and how we interact with one another, and exploring these deep intimate relationships. And uh, you know that could be a horror book, that could be science fiction, that could be a, a CIA thriller. Um, but what what we as readers really connect with are those those characters and uh so yeah what while you know you know what do you know about cia or 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 seal teams what you do know are about these relationships and uh and very pointedly uh, bring out thank you Uh, you're you're welcome um the you said that you at at first it felt like you were writing uh two different books and then you know found a way to weave them together uh so Anna is our main character but there's another narrator in the book can you tell us um about that and how that storyline starts to unfold sure the book moves back and forth between a sort of third person story which is Anna's story and a first person sort of confession a very early title for the book was um, Interrogation or Confession. Um, obviously, one of the big stories out of CIA over the last decade has been the story of these in- enhanced interrogation techniques. And while I didn't want to get into that for a number of different reasons, I felt like I needed to nod to it. And when I looked at CIA, one of the things I started getting really interested in was the phenomenon of the polygraph how you get polygraphed regularly as an employee of CIA and this whole question of trust and who trusts you and um, how do you inspire and then keep trust. And I found out that 
as I write in the book, um, the person who invented the polygraph is the person who wrote the Wonder Woman cartoon. And if you remember, Wonder Woman is defined by her golden lasso of truth. If she, if she ropes you in her lasso, you can only tell the truth, which of course is the concept of the polygraph. And I thought it was interesting to um, have a first person narrator very much based on this, um, this one case officer who had been willing to talk to me, but then I give him lots of, um, you know, lots of other stories I learned over the course of my research. But the idea is that one person is trying to talk to Anna and tell her something. And what you think in the beginning of the book is that he's telling you, the reader, about the culture of CIA. Let me tell you about the training at a farm. Let me tell you about the hypocrisy and bureaucracy and internal politics of China. Let me tell you about how everyone inside this organization looks down on everyone else because in everyone's own mind, they are the tip of the spear. Um, you know, Russia House looks down on China Ops and China Ops looks down on Latin America and Latin America looks down on Ground Branch and whatever. Um, I tried to get, I, I felt I needed a character to, to have that voice. And then, of course, what you learn uh, about midway through the book or um, whenever you get to your connecting of the two stories is that what he, the story he's telling her is the story of her father. So this other narrator had been sort of Anna's father's protege. He's the one who's going to tell her what happened to her father, but only after he's told her enough about CIA that she understands the institution. If understanding the institution is critical to understanding the choice her father made, which was the choice to help save the life of a young Chinese. Well, and CIA really becomes a great metaphor for all of the the uh, the darker side of our nature, the fear, the um, the paranoia, and, uh, and and all of that stuff. And it really becomes um, a great tool uh, to tell that kind of story where Anna has to peel back the layers of all the things that, that she's been wrestling with. Thank you. I mean, I, um, I can see why John le Carré, who really is the master, kept writing about spies because they are totally fascinating as metaphors for all of the human things that we wrestle with. Um, trust, loyalty, um, it's just, it's just such rich stuff. And, um, you know, I have my epigraph from an essay that Norman Mailer wrote about Watergate. Um, and in it, he basically says, you know, uh, you, you will never understand CIA. You know, you, 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 you look at CIA and you can start to assemble theories, but you will never get at the heart of what the organization is. And, uh, certainly as a civilian outsider who never worked there. I had the experience of, I went to Langley and um, I had the experience of uh, thinking maybe I could, I could, again, as I had with 11 days, maybe I can tell a story differently here. That's what I tried to do. Well, Lee, I absolutely love the new book. It's called Red, White, Thank Blue. You. It's uh, it's available everywhere now uh, in, in hardback and, and now paperback and uh, audiobook and Kindle edition. Um, it, if you uh, if people are just learning about you and and all of the stuff that you're doing, is there a place where they can connect with you online to uh, to <laughs> dig into your catalog um, and find out what's next? I, I I guess they can just email me. I don't I don't have a website, but um, or they can go to the Knopf website. Um, but I'm working on a, I'm working on a few things. I'm really excited about a new short story coming out this month in the Swanee review. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm working on a, on a television show and slowly incubating the next book. So. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, well, I'm going to put links to the books in the, uh, in your Amazon page in the uh, show notes and we'll, we'll link up your publisher as well. Uh, Lee, I'm a big fan, uh, and I love what you're doing. Um, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. You have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. 
On the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, Joey locked the doors of the Washington Irving Chapel and checked the windows from the outside, making sure that the cemetery offices were dark. Satisfied, he donned a knit cap and trudged uphill to the employee parking lot. He'd forgotten how desolate the grounds became at night. A fog had gathered, blurring the moon and stars. His rusty Volkswagen Beetle, christened Ladybug by Jason, sat in shadow alongside his dad's white van, which bore an image of the horseman and the cemetery's web address. Joey swept a palmful of condensation from Ladybug's windshield and fumbled for his keys. He heard a laugh, high and young. He froze. Hello? He shook off goose flesh and found his key. He started the engine and backed out, headlights off, praying not to knock over a headstone, again. A child stood on the hillside amongst the graves. You okay, kid? Cemetery's closed. He turned on his headlights. The child vanished. Joey idled in the drive, frowning. What had just happened? He turned off the headlights and waited for his eyes to adjust. The silhouette reappeared. The child stood in the road now, blocking his way. He and the ghost stared at each other. He bit his tongue and squinted over the steering wheel. He couldn't resolve the ghost's features, only a tiny body in... Ruffles? Yes, a dress. A little girl with shoulder-length hair. The figure crouched, threw its arms over its head and skipped away. A giggle followed after. The ghost skipped up the hill, turned around, and beckoned through the fog. Please come. Joey shook his head. No way. Ain't gonna happen. But he felt compelled to follow. What could a little girl do to him after all? He would keep a safe distance. The gravel sounded like soft rain beneath his tires. It drew him helplessly, past weeping cypresses and mausoleums blue with moonlight. He followed the giggle, the skipping ribbons, the little body made of shadow and quicksilver. The north end of the cemetery grounds rose to a steep wooded slope. The ghost had led him to Section 77, the northernmost boundary of the cemetery, but he'd lost her. He killed the engine, summoned his courage, and climbed out. The night air brought him fully awake. Where are you? He whispered, scanning the graves. A row of diseased hemlock trees stood at the fence line. Joey knew them well. They were dying, infested by some parasite called, he fished for the name, Woolly Adelgig. His crew had cut them back many times, lopping off limbs and heads, trying to save them. The hemlocks had grown back twisted and tormented. They stood as a row of grotesque sentinels guarding the threshold of the forest. The ghost climbed the slope, spun at the fence, and sat hugging her knees. The black mass of the Rockefeller State Park Preserve loomed behind her. What do you want? Joey whispered. Play. He stepped forward, hands shaking. He just wanted to see her face, the face of a real ghost. To see the curve of her cheek, the sparkle that might have been her left eye. Come and play, Joey. He froze. The sound of his name terrified him. She pointed over his shoulder. Play with us. He turned and realized his mistake. He'd driven with his eyes on the girl, trying not to lose her, never looking behind. They had been followed. <laughs>